Committee, House Education Committee, and the House um, Corrections and Institutions Committee here looking at H409, 209, excuse me, um, a bill related to uh, school construction. Um, we're going to do this in kind of three different groups. Um, we're going to be hearing sort of a statement of the problem from some of our school districts, kind of get an idea about what's happening on the ground. Um, then we're going to have David Epstein and uh, Jeff Francis, who are going to totally solve the problem for us by telling us how we're going to address this. Or at least, at least the truth is, they're going to be telling us a little bit about what's happening in other states. And as well as listening to, to our treasurer, Beth Pierce. Because of time, um, I'd like to invite the treasurer to come up first. And just because she is named in this bill as someone who would be looking at funding options. So we are, we are delighted to have the treasurer and glad to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, well, okay. Um, so uh, I'll just get this out of the way. For those who are looking at uh, my face, I fell. Uh, this is winter and things happen. Uh, and uh, you clearly hired me for my number skill, not my grace. And uh, so thank you very much. I got to get that out of the way first. So, um, so um, I, have, um, I have a science teacher when I was young named Mr. Horner, seventh grade. And he taught a scientific method. And he said, the first step is define the problem. And that's as far as I've got. OK, so um, I've got some issues and uh, some background and some concerns. And I don't have a, a, a great number of solutions at this point, but uh, some comments on potential solutions. So. Uh, as we all know, there's been a moratorium. Uh, prior to that, uh, when that moratorium was set, she was still paying down roughly about $10 million, I believe, out of the capital bill a year, something in that range. And I believe that was uh, paid down around 2016, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, you know, it's, um, the first question I have is, you know, are school construction costs a good fit for bonding? And you know, I would go back to a report, frankly, uh, that Captain Denham made, did in 2008, and I think the other one was 2012. There's some very good information in there. I think she did a great job on it. You know, but essentially, you're, uh, you're paying your share through, uh, through a capital fund comes at a cost because you know you're, you're, this is the reimbursement piece, and now you're putting that into a capital bill. Uh, so there's one issue is you know is that the most appropriate way to do it? Second. Uh, you know, the amount of money that we currently have uh, for capital authorizations, the uh, chair was looking at me uh, uh, and, and not too happy with our numbers. Over the last uh, six years, we've had a 23% reduction in the amount of money that's available for uh, authorization through the capital bill. Our current level is 123,180,000 uh, for a two-year period. Uh, we do this on a biennium now. Um, you also kind of supplement that with uh, recycled, unused dollars from, uh, from completed projects or projects that uh, haven't been spending or, or may, maybe uh, dropped in, in something called bond premium, which we won't go through here. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, uh, there is some additions to it. On the other side this year coming up, uh, we, were, we were advised uh, that the uh, housing bond, the $37 million housing bond, is net tax supported debt. Uh, so that's going to be added to our calculations going forward, which will put additional pressures on the, uh, the capital bill as well. And if we're doing that one, we think that at this point, at least my recommendation, I'm the chair, but I'm one vote, uh, is that the uh, transportation infrastructure bonds should be included as well. So there's going to be some upward uh, or, or downward pressures, excuse me, uh, in terms of the authorizations. On the other side, uh, we do see a tick up of, of, of uh, bond issuance right now, and that may be deferred maintenance that folks have had. Um, we're, not, we're not quite sure, but we don't know the level. So when I'm saying be careful, recognize there are, there are pressures on this, it could go up. Uh, I would say, frankly, it's more likely to go down a little bit or, or stay the same. We don't know. Um, we won't know until the fall when we get uh, what's called the, uh, the Moody's debt meetings to take a look at that, as well as um, working with Jeff Carr and the revenue numbers, uh, the economy, and putting that all together. And uh, we won't have a number for you for the next biennium until uh, sometime in September. Uh, but uh, putting it into the, uh, putting any school construction into the uh, capital bill, you're crowded already. And it's a policy question your folks are going to have to make. But again, I think that uh, uh, it's, it, it's 
there's a lot of, of needs, capital needs, and uh, you're, you're going to have to make that decision. But uh, it, it's problematic. See, I'm telling you to find the problem. Sorry. Uh, you know, currently uh, uh, AOE has uh, capacity. Uh, the capacity to administer these are also pro uh, a problem. You know, they uh, a lot of the staff that used to do this work are gone, and uh, you know, uh, ratcheting up is going to be a problem. Uh, if you were, if you were to do that, uh, it's not something that can easily be done. Um, and uh, you know, and I would cite a 2012 report that the AOE, and I'm going to quote this, although my handwriting is terrible. So here we go. The department is only reviewing projects at the request of districts wishing to exclude the cost from their excess spending calculations. And a little later in the report. Practices and measures which were required and approved uh, as a condition for state funds have not necessarily been completed during the uh, suspension of funding. So you've got some issues in terms of whether, you know, uh, who approves the projects, what are the criteria, you know, uh, are, they, are they meeting code, are the procurement processes uh, something that you're comfortable with? Uh, there are a lot of issues uh, if you were to take a look at the uh, agency getting more involved in, in that approval process and reinvigorating that process. I can't speak to the Agency of Education, what their capacity is. I can't speak uh, to, to whether they think this is a good idea. This, it's, it's something that they would have to, to, to say. But based on the 2012 report, I would say there's some concern about capacity and, uh, and, uh, and the ability to move forward on, on, a, you know, on a dime. You know, uh, turning the ocean line on a dime doesn't usually work. And you need to have some discussions with staff that are very good. I have a lot of respect for the folks over at the Agency of Education. Um, the other issues that I would see, and again, this is to find the problems. Uh, there's no, to my knowledge, and maybe there exists one, uh, uh, not a company's inventory of uh, the conditions out there, the need for infrastructure. Uh, I hear reports of uh, about 550 million of uh, bonding. I don't know whether that, you know, how that fits into prioritization of what's uh, what's in need of uh, immediate repair. Uh, what are some of the conditions out there? Uh, there's another question that I think would have to be answered if you if you moved in that direction, which is what about retroactive aid for projects that were completed already? And, uh, and again, the capacity review and analyze projects uh, at AOE, and I can't, again, I can't speak to them, but I think it's something that should be reviewed. Uh, the continued process of bonding pulls up, poses other risks. You know, impact on the education fund and equity across all schools is something that you folks have been tackling. Uh, I don't need to, uh, to, to, to go further into that. And again, uh, no, no uh, control on school uh, construction approvals. Um, and and I, I won't repeat that piece. Um, if they were completed in a different way, so let's say you're not going to go through uh, that process and you, and you see the bonding that's out there, and I, as I said, I've seen reports of about $550 million. Um, I talked to Michael Gunn at the Bond Bank and think that's probably uh, a close to number of what we see in terms of uh, things. Now, what passes and what doesn't on town meeting day you know, will, will, will imp impact that. But if it's completed through the bond bank, uh, and Michael can speak to these issues, there's going to be a concentration risk in the portfolio. In term, you know, right now the portfolio I think is around, and Michael might be here, you know, 600 million, um, and uh, you know you're talking about a big piece in one sector, and how the rating agencies would look at that. Is, is there a need to create a separate uh, um, uh, deal for these schools, and how would that work? Uh, there are two other issues with that. Uh, the way that the bond bank uh, gets reduced a lower uh, credit risk, so they're doing bet, you know get a lower rate on their bonds. There are two ways. One is through moral obligation, where the state is saying we will put our moral obligation on these bonds, um, and while it's not a legal requirement to pay if the debt service was not met, um, it uh, there's certainly a moral obligation that we would have difficulty in the markets if we were to uh, uh, renege on that. To be very frank. Um, I'm not as worried right now about moral law because you have your full, full faith and credit behind it uh, of the municipality or the uh, the uh, issue, uh, the entity that uh, is receiving the funds. After that, you've got uh, bond bank reserves, you've got uh, other reserves. So ours is a little belt and suspenders to the process. 
Um, but uh, uh, there is an issue um, around that, and I'll get to that in a second. The other way they do it is a state intercept, which is uh, if, if someone was not to pay, and that's not been the case, just for the record, it's been very good, but the rating agencies want to have some security that you're going to pay the bonds. And we have a state intercept program right now uh, so that if, if ABC municipality didn't pay its, uh, its, its, its payment, you could, uh, you could hold uh, other aid that the state has and intercept it. There's not a one-on-one -on -one match to these in the schools in terms of because some schools, it, you know, it, it, it travels different ways to the local treasurer and so on. So <clears throat> that's going to be a little bit of a matching problem. Um, the Bob Bank is looking at several alternatives. I would say, as a member of the bond bank and as a treasurer, I don't think we have the answers yet on that. Um, the other issue with moral law, getting back to that, is that we have an informal policy. When you look at the rating agencies, they've done some look at moral law across states. Everybody uses it a little differently. Um, they did recommend some changes in language that made it a little more secure several years ago. Uh, but we've had an informal policy, which is in our Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee report. It's a long statement, and I'm going to make it even longer. That 200 to 225 percent of our net tax supported debt outstanding uh, is the limit we would put on what we, we would uh, extend to our, uh, moral law. At 200 percent, that leaves about roughly $201 million of capacity, and you're talking more than that in outstanding um, um, uh, or, or potential, I should say, that potential bonds. Uh, so that is an issue. And again, some of them may go through the intercept rather than that. Uh, but it does put some pressure on that. And as you know, VITA and other agencies, um, VHFA, um, usually looking for capacity. Right now, most of them are under capacity. For instance, VHFA hasn't used all of its um, moral law capacity. VITA has, um, and typically uh, looks to, um, to increase that as their, as their uh, the good work that they do. So that's going to be another pressure in this process. So in summary, what I would say is that, uh, uh, that using the capital bill, will, it may not be enough capacity in the capital bill. Um, also consider the cost of borrowing. Uh, the current Ed Fund expenditure process is, is, is essentially, and I'm, I mean, I've, I've read Act 68 a couple of times and I'm still dizzy. Um, and uh, what I would say is that uh, I see some potential equity issue uh, in that. Um, the inventory is needed because what school needs it versus what doesn't. The capacity issue to approve, review them is an issue. And if borrowing uh, uh, continues, uh, you know, it, as I said, it, it could press up against the state's moral obligation uh, issue. And uh, so that's my end of the problems. Um, I'd be happy to have conversations with you at uh, the rest of the scientific method there and, and what are you going to do and you know, research, state your hypothesis. I would really encourage you not to put me as the, uh, the lead on, an, uh, on, a, uh, on a process. Um, I'm already on 30 boards and committees. And I'm trying to uh, to delegate some of those, and uh, while we can be helpful, I don't think we're in a position. Uh, our budget is actually lower than it was in 2009 for our state administrative budget. So we're lean, but not mean. And uh, we, but we would, uh, we I don't think we have the capacity or the particular expertise to do this kind of work. Um, but uh, we would be happy to have conversations and work with uh, someone, but I think there's a lot of work to be done before you come to what that uh, answer is, or getting back to Mr. Horner stating your hypothesis. Okay. So uh, those are my comments, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? Representative Conlon. Would you just uh, repeat uh, a paragraph? I was trying to write down numbers, and, and I got behind. It was when you were talking about the 225% sure. of debt outstanding and what that translated to? Sure. Well, I get it at 200 because uh, what we do is we take our debt outstanding, and I actually have a chart, which I'd be happy to, let me walk through it. So right now our debt outstanding, uh, the state's net, out, net tax, net tax supported debt, okay? I know I left out a, 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 a word there, but it's 659,838,000. Um, and when you take a look at that, and, 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 and say at 200 percent of that, uh, it's about uh, um, one, one, 
one million three hundred and eighteen thousand were actually at one million one hundred and seventeen and change, leaves you roughly two hundred two hundred and one million to go, and uh, uh, that that uh, is in in in. In the past, I'd say, yeah, I've got plenty of, uh, plenty of capacity, but if you're looking at school building um, in, in this, this process and what's coming, you know, coming due. Now, Michael's great, and Michael's done some good work on looking at what's the cash flow, because at certain, you know, the bond bank, we would be dropping off money as it's outstanding. We need to take a look at the cash flows uh, post town meeting day and see what that looks like um, before we can finish that process. But I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, sir. What, uh, what effect does a recession have on, on these bonds? Should they? Well, again, if they're backed, backed by the full faith and credit of the municipality, it, it starts there. Uh, I do get concerned when I see large amounts of money um, and um, you know, the, uh, the ability to pay that during a, a market decline. Uh, you have to pay it. Uh, it's full faith and credit, uh, and uh, uh, you know the bond bank uh, would use the intercept program where necessary. But uh, uh, it is it is something we need to look at. I, I don't know what the inventory is, and I think that's the biggest. If I were looking at this, I'd say the first thing is what's the need? What's the real need out there? Uh, not just what's out there for bonding, but what what's the condition of our schools, um, and how do we get our, our you know, a handle on that is the first step. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, bonding, full faith and credit's a good thing if you're putting your GO from an investor's perspective. If it's a revenue bond, it's a little more dicey, but that's not what these will be, so. Thank you. Any? So, I would say, um, when we did the water quality bill, you were the lead on that in terms of looking at yes. the options. Unfortunately, you did a really good job. <laughs> Thank um, you. But and, and for that, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> from, from what I understand you're saying is do not make me, do not make me the lead. So the last time on the, on the clean water, I was not in the room when it was assigned. Good point. Uh, so uh, I, I, um, I was voluntold or something like that. But uh, I'm here today. We want to be helpful, but I don't think it's our expertise. Uh, we would be happy to be, be helpful in this process. And I think, frankly, right now we're working on a housing project, uh, uh, not just looking at a housing bond, but how do you, how do you relate housing to economic development, homelessness, uh, needs for individuals with disabilities, and that's a pretty extensive project. I have one policy director who's behind me, Ashlyn Doyon, who's very, very bright, but uh, there's a limited capacity that we have to pick this up. We would be happy to help. <coughs> Uh, but I don't, I, I'm hoping that we are not uh, designated as a lead on this. So you uh, approve of the idea that we have in the bill of getting that inventory? I, absolutely. You absolutely. Um, agree that we need to look at other options other than the capital bill? I will um, agree with that. Would be, would be funding and don't make you the lead. It don't make me the lead. The only other thing I would say is that when you're looking at this, for instance, Massachusetts is a dedicated revenue source, but they're a bigger place and they, they do things you know, a little differently than here. You can use existing revenues. You can use the ed fund if that's your policy decision. Um, you can dedicate a revenue source to this. The bottom line for me on this would be um, that if you do whatever revenue source or, or, or existing funds that you use, they need to be reliable dependable over time, getting to your point about a recession, um, and uh, um, something that's measurable that you can do each year. And that's kind of the criteria we use in the clean water study as well. And the other point I would make is when we did the clean water, we looked at 60 different revenue sources um, because we had 23 stakeholder meetings with 1,000 people. And we had an individual over at the tax department who's now the deputy auditor uh, who uh, uh, was an economist, and we modeled each one of them. So it's an extensive process. So I have a question. And I don't know if it's more appropriate for other folks or for you as a state treasurer, but our state construction dollars, school construction dollars that in the past when we had the program did not cover the full cost of that construction. 
for that school district. I think it was about 30 percent. Yes. 30 percent of eligible costs, mm -hmm. which there were criteria that went along with that. Yep. To do an inventory, wouldn't it be more appropriate to have that criteria as a basis so that we could figure out what are the wants and what are the needs out there? I think they, it's they're a very, very different. Point. The wants and the needs are very different, yeah. and any state dollars goes more towards the needs and not the wants. Uh, I was there at the beginning. Uh, I certainly can't speak to this, but at the beginning of the Massachusetts process. Um, um, remember the person who came up with the idea of the revenue source, and, uh, but it uh, wasn't me, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, they put criteria around the approval process. And if you're going to do that, I think you need to know when you're looking and you're categorizing inventory, you know, what's within something that the state would, would you know, so what's the full inventory, what's the full need, and what are the things the state on a policy level, when you got to set that policy, uh, would uh, consider uh, something that they would be eligible for reimbursement. So I think that it is a complicated process. So I would almost think you would need to know what the criteria is before you figure out that you're going to open it up to state dollars. You need to know what you're funding and not have the funding first and then figure out what you're going to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else? Representative Austin? Yep. Um, one of the goals of Act 46 was efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, would it make sense to wait a little while to see how that plays out in terms of consolidations? And maybe do the highest priorities of school districts but look at, you know, the school's going to consolidate or if efficiencies are realized? Well, that's a good point. Um, I, I, um, you know, a lot's going on with consolidation. Uh, it's having an impact, by the way, in the pensions. I'm just, I like to throw this one in. But, you know, I always look at cost as a, you know, as like a balloon. If you press the balloon at this end, in terms of consolidation and cost, at the other end, you have t choices that teachers uh, might be making or other folks might be making around their retirement that are not what we expected in terms of the time. So they're gonna be in retirement longer, Maybe uh, it gets complicated, but you know those are the kind of things. And I think the same analogy works here, that as you're looking at this and you're looking at what's happening at the local level and they're making changes, it has an impact on our costs uh, in terms of construction. And I don't know whether the answer is to wait. Again, I'm not the expert there, but it certainly has to be factored into the process. We're looking at that now from a retirement side, you know, pressing that balloon you need to take a look at it in terms of you know the, the, the whole cost of construction and uh, making sure that our students are safe at the same time. I mean that for me is the most pressing thing in this. You know is making sure that our students are safe and doing that inventory helps that because you know where you have the emergencies and where you know you need to reach out and make changes so that uh, every uh, every child in this state uh, has a uh, great teachers and a great place to, uh, to study and, uh, and grow as citizens. Representative Taylor. Well, I'm wondering if you can recall when we were talking about the criteria for the loans, whether how detailed the Massachusetts ones. It was, it was detailed. That's, again, I left before they got through all that process. I was there when they identified the revenue source and, and, and the basic planning structure. I do have, uh, we talked, and I think you're having some folks come in from Massachusetts, uh, and uh, they did a presentation to you folks back then, several years, because this presentation uh, uh, that was done two treasurers ago. Um, and, uh, uh, it's a long time ago. And a long time ago. Madam Treasurer, we are going to have some Excellent. people present, presenting that. Uh, and I think they're trying to get people to answer that question. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. I mean, I've looked at, and I've talked to these folks, uh, but, they're the best experts on their own state. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So we have a lineup of superintendents and perhaps a, you know, someone bringing along a school board member. Um, because we have so many, I'm going to limit you to five minutes. I'm going to limit you to five minutes. 
We'll give up, and, and Kathleen, if you could um, just do that, she's going to do some timing. So she'll give you the way. I, I, I'm just going to give an extra minute to, to bring it bring it to, to, to conclusion. So that's an extra, I don't know, it's an extra 10 or 15 minutes because we have quite a few people here. Um, so if we can we can do that, and, and committee members, um, the two chairs have talked about holding your questions until everybody is finished. So I would, if you have a question for a specific person, I would um, make note of that, and then you can ask it when we finished all these. This is quite a, quite a few people here. So first will be um, Kingdom East. So that's Jennifer. Bonso Jordan. Bonso Jordan. And you're you're here alone, correct? I am. Yes. Yes. And um, um, Patrick Green from Mount Abel will be on deck. Okay. <clears throat> well, so thank you very much for hearing me. My name is Jennifer Bonzo Jones, and I work at Kingdom East School District, which is in the Northeast Kingdom. This is my fourth year. Prior to that, I worked at Chittenden East as the assistant superintendent, and then I was the principal of Mount Mansfield. Prior to that, I worked in Montpelier, and prior to that, I was at Rock Point School in Burlington for seven years. I'm going to do three parts of a presentation. I'm going to show you photos of specific examples. And then I'm going to talk about the big picture, and then I'm going to say next moves. Cut me off whenever you need to. This is a picture of sewage ejection pumps that are in classrooms in Lewinburg School. Now it would be nice to say let's get rid of these sewage ejection pumps, but we can't because they are on a slab foundation. Actually, can I have someone heard this from me? They're on a slab. The septic system cannot be repaired because of the infrastructure of the town. And this is also because of the residential neighboring wells and the water district. So I've got a school where young people are sitting right next to these pumps in their classroom. That's Lunenburg School. Next one is going to be. You can line them up down here beside. This is Concord School. Concord School. The gym was built in the 1960s. It's a prefab, pre-built piece of equipment. No insulation in the walls, and the idea is the heat from the gym would melt the ice, and that's how you get the roof done. There's no insulation. We did an audit, $1.4 million to fix the heating, because the heating can't keep full throttle melting the snow. There's an issue with snow melt. Right now, if there's more than 10 pounds per square foot on the roof, we have to close the gym. Last year, the gym was closed for over 40 days. No sports, no athletics, no gym. Our PE teacher was having gym inside the school. In addition, the Concord School has a road that goes through campus. There was no theater, no play, and there's immense energy costs. The square footage of the school of Concord is half that of Linden. They paid more in energy costs last year because of this roof. Next one, yeah. Next one is Burke. This is Burke Town School. What you see here is the middle school classroom. It is a 40 plus year old trailer that was bought from another school. What you see is the skirting underneath, which occasionally gets blown out because it's a trailer and they're skirting. Uh, what happened with this curtain last year is that the whole curtain broke. We had backed up septic. We had to close the classrooms. Now, if you, those of you who are outdoorsy, you know that we have over 90,000 visitors per year in Berg because of Kingdom Trails. It's a hub. People come in. Population in this town is growing. Our classes, our sixth grade class has 36 kids in it. It's very, we're, we're in trouble. We don't have a space for all of our kids to get together. So that's Berg. This is Gilman Middle School. I'm very nervous. Can you see me shaking? <laughs> so this is Gilman Middle School. This is a picture of the basement. What you see here is standing water in the basement. And you see mold. This is below the floodplain. And you also, we had a pump inside there to get that out. There's standing water. In addition to this school, we're not ADA compliant. It's a very old building. We have a little person in our school who has a really hard time getting to classes upstairs. There's mold and there's lead. Thank you. 
And in the, in the, because of time, I'm not going to go through all my schools. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go and give you my total district picture. I have two other schools and two other stories, but I will just stop here. Here's my district picture. Here's my district. This is the total district picture page. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the lead. I have one minute left. So I was going to go through and talk about lead and air quality. But what I really want to talk to you about is the impact on student learning. We have had school canceled twice this year because of septic backed up and we couldn't have kids in the building. We've got eight schools. We are trying to figure out what to do. And can you turn that? Actually, let's, let's do this one. Can you put that one down. Lots of pictures here. So here's the next move. So, nope, other side. Hey, my handy assistant. Here's what I think your job is. I think your job is to legislate. And I want to talk about this issue of equity. I used to work in Chittenden East, and I can guarantee you that in Underhill, Jericho, Huntington, Richmond, and Bolton, this would never happen. Because I live in an area that's poor, our children don't get the same education. What my job is, we had a vote, we had a bond vote, it failed. We've now done an analysis. We have analyses this fat of all of our schools. We know what we need to do. We're putting out there 10 different options, which includes combining schools. And we're working on moving forward to have a plan. But I'm, I'm not sure that our communities will pass a bond. And we're struggling. So I ask you, and I thank you very much for your work. And that's it for now. I imagine at some point there will be questions. <laughs> okay, who wants to go after that? Do you want these out or do you want these? Um, do you want these left here? Um, just leave them up and go yeah. after the questions. You got it. Um, we have uh, Patrick Green. And we have Karen Conroy on deck. Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Green. I'm superintendent for the Mount Abraham Unified School District. It's my fourth year in that district as superintendent. Prior to that, I was principal in Middlebury at the Middlebury Union Middle School. Um, and I'm going to talk with you a little bit about sort of the Mount Abraham story. Jen did a great job articulating the, the story uh, in the kingdom. And I want to also acknowledge some of the financial realities. We heard from um, our treasurer about some of those. And maybe offer a more immediate relief option um, given some of those financial realities. So I'm going to talk specifically about Mount Abraham Union Middle High School, uh, which is in Mount Abraham Unified School District. So the Mount Abraham story, uh, the, the building was built in 68. Uh, the doors opened in 1969. So about 50 years old. And those past 50 years have been two significant uh, construction projects. 2005, there was an addition of 8 to 10 classrooms. And in 2007, we added a wood chip boiler. That's essentially the extent of the, the construction projects over the past 50 years. The school currently carries no long-term debt. So I want to talk about, on a good day, what, what some of the challenges are we face in, in Mount Abraham. So on a good day, we have accessibility challenges. There's a single, less than reliable elevator, a band room filled with concrete risers, etc. We have several classrooms that don't have any exterior windows. They're sort of landlocked classrooms. So those, those classrooms lack daylight. Those classrooms also oftentimes are pass-through classrooms. So a student who's in a classroom that's sort of on the exterior wall of the building that used to use a restroom walks through another classroom, uh, disrupting whatever instruction's happening there to head to the, to the restroom. Um, we also have outdated science labs, one example being a chemistry lab that has a drenched shower, which is great, only there's no floor drain in that chemistry room. So should someone need that um, drenched shower, that will create problems in other areas of the building. Um, Bathrooms that are really in bad shape, locker rooms that are um, in even worse shape, dated classrooms, dated hallways, dated auditorium and cafeterias. Uh, some of our rooms don't have sufficient heat, so there are space heaters. Uh, the building is not sprinklered. And we have ongoing plumbing, electrical, and security concerns. So those are on good days. Uh, not all days, uh, unfortunately, are good days. So on bad days, we find ourselves responding to emergency needs. Uh, we have, uh, for example, we had an aging drainage system that led to our gym floor being um, flooded and ruined our gym floor in October of 2017. October is perhaps the worst time possible to be having to replace a gym floor just prior to winter sports season and physical education, etc. 
Uh, that cost us about $250,000 to fix that we didn't really have much option but to fix. In 2018, some tiles fell off a wall in the locker room, exposing mold. We had the locker room shut down for several months, and we're now in the process of replacing all four locker rooms um, so that we can make sure that we take care of uh, any other potential mold that's there, any um, other air handling kind of needs that may be needed to prevent the, the mold from returning in the future. We're estimating that at about $1.9 million, and that will be happening uh, starting this summer. And just this past December, our aging boilers stopped working, and um, it wasn't quite cold enough for our wood chip plant to quite get up to, to speed, so we found ourselves really um, in a pinch trying to make sure that the building could stay open. So funding-wise, um, a feasibility a study was conducted in 2014. We found that about $17 million was what needed to be uh, just to bring the infrastructure kind of up to speed, not to mention any of the reconfiguration to take care of the landlocked classrooms, et cetera. So we, uh, the, the bond that ultimately went out was for $32.6 million, and that failed 27% to 73%. FY17, the Mountain Board put a million dollars into the construction services uh, line in the budget. So built a million dollars into our general fund, because plan A was to get a bond to pass. That was unsuccessful. Plan B could no longer be do nothing. So they put a million dollars in, and we've been using that million dollars to make improvements ever since. Thank you. Um, so in FY18, we put the million dollars in. Now we have about half of the bond cost in our budget already, so it mitigates the impact on the tax rate, um, and still failed two more times to pass bonds. So over three on passing bonds to fix this. In the meantime, our construction costs are going up faster than our, than our uh, pay raises, so the ability to do this work gets further and further out of reach. I know there's a challenge in finding money. Um, I acknowledge that. There, I've looked around. There aren't any money trees planted on the grounds. Um, there is an, op an option that could, at least in the Mount Abraham Unified School District's case, provide some immediate relief, which is the million dollars that we have in construction services that we've been putting into this building does not get exempted from our cost for equalized pupil. We are currently at the spending threshold. We anticipate having to cut 15 positions a year to stay there. If the million dollars that we have in construction services could not count against us in terms of our cost for equalized pupil and the spending threshold, that would alleviate a lot of pressures while we figure out can we continue to operate all the schools that we have as we face declining enrollment. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Conroy from Essex North, and let's have Julie Finnegan from Slate Valley on, on deck. Thank you. I appreciate you um, inviting me here today. Um, my name is Karen Conroy. I'm the superintendent for Essex North Supervisory Union. I have um, one school, um, an elementary and a high school um, in my area, but I serve um, the communities of any cake choice. So I have 300 other students that have choice. Uh, I'm here because we have been trying to look for ways um, to continue to provide opportunities for our students, and we've been getting creative with our um, counterparts over in New Hampshire, um, looking at how we can geographically work together as a region, um, as an interstate school district. And as part of this, um, which I think is important to give you this little bit of background, um, as part of this option of working together um, with our New Hampshire schools, we, we don't have any other options to merge with anyone in Vermont. We have been um, designated as geographically isolated, so we don't have a lot of options. So uh, we have had support from um, Secretary French and also the New Hampshire Commissioner of Education um, in New Hampshire, and has actually um, created or actually declared our formation of an interstate school district um, for these planning board purposes and for exploration. And as part of this process, um, the Canaan Schools has been identified as the um, strategic place for a regional high school in our area. We have three area high schools. Our students live within 20 miles of our location. And um, we only have 200 kids going to three high schools. So there's an opportunity to, that we can work with New Hampshire. Um, in supporting the needs of our student, providing more opportunity at a better cost to our taxpayers. 
Um, through this process, though, um, we have done significant research over the last couple of years and um, gone into each of these buildings to try to figure out the best educational model for our students, for our area, for our taxpayers. And what we are finding is the schools in Vermont are in a lesser condition compared to the New Hampshire schools. And it's really triggered our committee to stop and say, you know, maybe Canaan isn't the right place. Um, and so through this um, process, um, the committee seeked out um, funding, and the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation has actually given us $17,500 to do a facility study of Canaan schools. Um, New Hampshire is supporting us tremendously because they know that we need to work together to provide opportunity for this geographic area. Um, so they had given us a study, we had this study done, and the findings of the study were devastating to the committee. Um, they have identified anywhere from four to nine million dollars in renovations and um, efficiency improvements that are needing, dealing with ventilation, heating, electrical windows, fire alarms, sprinklers, repairs, and accessibility. I have two handicapped students right now. Our building is not completely handicap accessible to them. Um, we have to move classroom, classrooms around to be compliant, um, to offer them. They can't go to the science lab because it's located in the basement of our building. So we have some um, significant needs for um, building aid, and our small little community of Canaan is not going to be able to afford to make those changes. And the New Hampshire schools have been right on top of of their needs and, and maintain what they're trying to do, so they don't want to pay for it either. So we, we really need, um, are looking for the state's support in helping us. I am putting out a bond um, to the community in March of a million dollars, um, trying to address the ADA compliance issues that we have. I have a roof repair, um, major roof repair that needs to be done. Um, and some, um, you know, I have original electrical panels um, from 1946, my building was built, my high school, Memorial High School was built in 1946, and um, my elementary school in 1960. And there's been little re renovations done um, since then. So our, as you know, our tax base is very limited in our area. Um, our residents are income sensitive, and we do have the highest poverty levels in the state in, in Essex County. And this is what I'm, I'm working with and trying to still provide what our students need for opportunity. And when it comes down to cutting programs, it doesn't seem very fair um, because I need to replace an electrical panel in my basement or I need to um, be able to fix the roof. Um, I have been trying to be very creative in um, reorganizing my classrooms. We have created multi-room classrooms. We're trying to be as creative as we can to save um, taxpayers' money. Um, but we're at a point where um, it's really putting a damper on our interstate discussions, and um, we're looking for support and hoping to move that forward and help us um, provide a better opportunity for the students in our North Country. Thank you. Um, Julie Fennigan, Slate Valley, and Bruce McIntyre of Addison on deck. Francis, are they here? Um, yeah, I should get to them. Julie Finnegan from Slate Valley. Okay, I don't know her, so I'm not sure what she's here. Okay. So Bruce McIntyre here. Okay, Bruce, thank you. Hello, I'm Bruce McIntyre from Boston Central School District. I'm the director of facilities there, uh, and. We have been going through the process of uh, doing assessments on our buildings and just actually completed an assessment of all of our elementary schools. Uh, and I, I feel fortunate I'm in a district that uh, even though our buildings are in some disrepair, are nowhere near what uh, Jennifer had presented. So uh, I'm thankful for that. However, we do have a statewide problem. Um, most buildings were built you know, between the the early 50s and late 60s, uh, there haven't been a lot of new buildings constructed. Uh, our, our district's no exception. Uh, our newest building is uh, 20 years old now, or 
22 years old. Uh, and as these systems age, you know, people put up a new building and think, hey, great, we don't have to do anything. Uh, the problem uh, becomes that uh, budgets are trimmed and facilities are often uh, top of the list for those cuts. Uh, and we make do, and we run systems to failure. So uh, in the facilities world, uh, the ideal thing is to do preventative maintenance. Um, and then if you can't do preventative maintenance, you do predictive maintenance. And then if you can't do predictive maintenance, you run systems to failure. And that's where most of our schools are at. So that means instead of replacing your boiler uh, after the 40 year mark when they say your boiler shouldn't function, uh, you just keep patching it up until it, it completely melts down and then you have an emergency. And I feel that a lot of our schools are in emergency mode. Uh, and because of that, uh, we are unable to address some of the um, problems that, that really affect student learning because we are always trying to patch a hole in the roof or um, abate the mold that's become exposed. Uh, when really what the, what we should be doing is planning ahead, taking care of our buildings, and planning for environments that will support our most vulnerable population. And I know that you are limited in what you can do financially. There's a lot of different uh, things that pull on the budget. Uh, and I think as uh, as our treasurer mentioned, you know, we have to identify the problem. Um, I have been working with a few people uh, over the past year to try and talk about that. And you'll hear a pre presentation from David Epstein and Truex Collins. And I'm sure that uh, what we've been working on, he'll, he'll present much more eloquently than I can say. Uh, but I really felt um, the need to come here and, and say to you, you know, this is a real problem statewide. Uh, this is uh, something we, we need to figure out. Uh, I am all for doing an inventory of buildings. I realize it's not going to be a quick fix, uh, but I would like to continue to be a part of the solution. So. Thank you. Um, we have David Young and Bridget Burkhart. <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm David Young, I'm the superintendent in South Burlington. Uh, joining me is Bridget Burkhart, she's the clerk of our board uh, in South Burlington. And um, we're here to talk to you a little bit in addition to what you've already heard about school construction. Uh, we'll give a little bit of an update about our, our project as well. Currently, you know, there's no funding structures in Vermont that supports anything with either large scale renovations or new construction. We never have had anything that has dealt with renovations. Some say we may have a statewide uh, funding formula that allows for that. However, when you try to do large scale renovations or new construction, that system creates major volatility on your, on your tax base and the draw from the Ed Fund. Uh, we in South Burlington have had for probably almost 13 or 14 years a stewardship plan. Looks at us, you know, Roofs, boilers, air handlers, major items. We're fortunate to have been able to do that, but at the same time, trying to carry those major, major uh, changes within your budget is just not sustainable. Uh, those costs are exorbitant, and you heard earlier from Mr. McIntyre about electrical panel or Jen Bonsajorn. We're dealing with systems that take up the size of this, this room almost of electrical systems that were designed to bring in electrical heat that are so outdated and so costly to find those replacement parts is ridiculous. Um, again, as we look to um, renovate or replace 50 to 80 year old buildings, it's unexpected that you can put it on the backs of the funding formula system currently in play. Again, there's no documentation currently that exists 
that I know of for any leaders in, in, in the state of Vermont that allows for any sort of information. There's nothing on file that I know of within Vermont that talks at all about warranties, any sort of compliance status um, for any schools. The import such as ADA accommodations, air quality, electrical systems, structural mechanical systems are non-existent. So many of these situations come to bear their, their true issues when a new person steps in the position and says, oh, by the way, we have a problem. It's unacceptable, from my perspective, that you walk into a position and say, ooh, we've got a leak, and come to find out nobody's kept track of the warranties or anything. We are in a tough, tough place. So obviously, I think it's critically important that you, that you reinstate some sort of a mechanism. And what I would say is it's deplorable, and I'm part of it, that we don't have a system. We cannot. I would say, unequivocally, after growing up and living all of my life in Vermont, with the exception of some service time, this is the largest crisis financially in Vermont. It's not $600 million. It's in the billions of dollars. Systems to replace are exorbitantly expensive. We put in an elevator last year, at, or about four years ago, at 1.2 million. If you did take 5% increase, you're up into the 2 million. Every single one of our systems are matriculating similarly. We need to act, and we need to figure it out. Bridget's gonna talk a little bit about our current plan, because we know we're short on time. Had a lot of other comments, but I'd be happy to answer questions at the end. So as David alluded, we are in the middle of a big project, most of you have probably heard about, to address issues at our middle and high schools. Um, so our middle school is 52 years old with no major renovations except the addition of an elevator. The high school is 60 years old. Again, the only major construction project on the high school was the elevator and an addition that was done in 1977. There have been no significant renovations to that 1977 addition. Um, we implemented, as David alluded, a long-term stewardship plan in 2008 to address issues as they come up in all five of our schools. We have three elementary schools plus our middle and high school. We've been keeping up with the smaller things. We've been putting those into our budget. We're putting small bonds together between a million and two million dollars. But the bigger things that are coming up as these buildings age and as major infrastructure systems get to the end of their usable lives, those things are really hard to put in an annual operating budget or in a bond that a community is going to pass on in an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So we are, one minute, okay. So what we did is we had a very thoughtful process put in place to do a phase one study that looked at infrastructure. We spent a year doing that, looking at infrastructure in middle and high school. Then we did a phase two study because we said if we're going to address infrastructure, it makes no sense to spend tens of millions of dollars of the community's money only to put students back into outdated buildings that don't meet our educational needs, that don't meet our capacity needs. We're one of the systems in Vermont that actually is experiencing increasing enrollment and we need to make sure we can address that. So after going through the phase one study for one year, the phase two study for a second year, um, the board determined that just doing infrastructure repair without addressing capacity issues, without addressing needs for educational um, changes that have happened since the 1960s and provide flexibility to address changes that are gonna happen in the future, we decided that building two new buildings was the right way for the community to plan for the next 60 or 70 years of education in our community. Thank you. Um, we have Mary Beth Banyas from Windsor Central, followed by Christine Sullivan from Harwood. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to address you. Um, my name is Mary Beth Banyas. I am the superintendent of Windsor Central Supervisory Union that includes the towns of Woodstock, Killington, Reading, Pomfret, Bridgewater, Barnard, and Plymouth. Um, I am also a former assistant superintendent in Massachusetts where we did have a strong school construction um, fund. Um, we are currently operating four elementary schools. One of our elementary schools is currently shut down due to mold and moisture issues. Um, and we have a middle school high school built in the 1950s um, that after a two year extensive study, has, we, the uh, conclusion has been reached that this is not a renovation. The, the needs and the issues are too significant, that the responsible financial choice is a new build, if at all possible, in terms of funding, and that we're looking at a cost of about $68 million 
across that are towns that are, do not have high populations. Um, when you try to put that on the taxpayers, it's not something that is feasible. Um, we are looking and overturning every rock that we possibly can in terms of trying to look at private public partnerships, are there federal grants that can help us, but we are in a situation in which we have a real sense of urgency. Many of the different um, situations that you've heard spoken about by my colleagues, such as septic issues that are in dire straits, um, we have steam pipes that go underneath the floors of our, our middle school, high school, and the, the flooring is collapsing in around them. We have heating issues. Um, none, almost none of our heaters now work. We can't buy replacement parts. They are more radiant heat. None of the actual blowing of the heat out into classroom works. We do not have fire suppression systems, and we, we do not have the capacity to put electricity in to have the magnetic door openers in case of a fire. That means that all the doors are closed during the summertime. Um, we have windows that are, are we struggle with, so you can imagine the, what those classrooms feel like for students, um, and trying to learn in environments like that. Um, the, the other piece that I would share with you is that this building was built in the 1950s when the model of education was that students came into a classroom, the teacher was the expert, that he or she imparted the information to students, students learned it and, and, and gave it back to the teacher. Um, that is not the, the educational model that we face in the, the, in the 21st century. We know that what students need to be able to do is to be able to grapple with complex problem solving. Um, and the environments that are designed for students to grapple with complex problem solving are not the environments of the 1950s. Um, and so that those, the, not only the facility issues that are existing, in our district and in um, so many other districts that you hear about across the state. There is also a, a reality around what learning looks like today. And there, we need students to be self-directed, right? We need students to be able to network, not only with their colleagues, but across the state and across the globe. We need students to try, fail, fix, learn how to deal with different iterations. The learning environments of the 1950s were not built for that. And so it impacts the quality of education that we can provide for our students and their ability to be prepared for their future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, finally, I'd like to um, also add on this idea of mobility um, that exists with families and that sense of competition, right? That as we look at Vermont and the, the school systems that we have, my colleague spoke um, about what she's experiencing in New Hampshire, um, families have choices. And they, when they look at our facilities, that can become a major concern in terms of wanting to remain in the state. Um, and feeling that their students are getting the high quality of education that they, they feel compelled to provide to them as parents. And I, I want to just close by I do, saying I do not envy any of you. This is an incredibly complex situation. I feel like you're being presented with lots of problems and no big solutions yet. Um, we want to work with you. Um, but it is a urgent issue. And I, in uh, speaking for my district, we need your help, and we look forward to partnering with you in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Christine Sullivan from Harvard, and is Julie Finnegan here or not? Okay. And this will be the last um, presentation of superintendents, unless there are others. Claire Wolf from Burlington School District, do you have on your I don't. <coughs> so, yeah, so that was a late email for me. To Okay. Great. Hi. Welcome. Uh, my name is Christine Sullivan. I'm a resident of Waitsfield, and I'm a member of the Harwood Unified Union School District Board. 
I've been a resident of the Waits, a uh, member of the Waitsfield Town School Board. Um, I served on our local study committee, um, and I've been on our unified board since its inception. Um, our board was able to successfully pursue an accelerated merger um, since we were a preferred model with uh, four small elementary schools, another elementary school district within our district that had a elementary school and a middle school, and then our Union High School. Um, so our district has had a formally identified and clearly articulated need for a bond at our high school facilities since 2015. Um, then the Harwood Board uh, identified nearly $15 million in upgrades needed for the purposes of health, safety, and welfare or replacement of systems at the end of their usable life. Additional projects were identified at that time as having the potential to improve the student experience. Um, one of those, for example, was upgrading the track, which would allow our students to host uh, track meets. Um, at the time that the Howard Board was ready to go to bond, in spring of 2015, the legislature passed Act 46. Uh, this deferred the bond as um, <coughs> Our supervisory union focused on the needs for the merger and the challenges that presented. Um, like most districts, we've seen the declines in enrollment, increases in ed spending, and per pupil expenditures and tax rates. Given those challenges and um, the difficulties we were having maintaining programming and a quality experience for students, it was hard to think uh, that we could get taxpayers uh, to readily support a bond at the time. Um, from the start, our merger and anticipated articles of agreement, um, there was a lot of contention due in large part to the need for a bond at one of the local elementary schools and the impact that people were worried about um, merger would have on the continued existence of our local elementary schools. I would say that to this day, there's a lot of focus on our elementary schools and as a group, um, as a district, there's a lot of neglect for the needs of the high school because perhaps there's no, um, we, we don't have that local connection to our union high schools. Um, so in, in part of our merger, the new district took on the bond for a local elementary school and, and one of the things that stands out to me is that perhaps part of the reason for some of this long-term neglect that's been going on is the changes in tax rates that some of the towns around our state saw uh, when Act 60 and 68 came through. They started to focus on preserving teachers over the structures and the student experience in the building, but environment does impact our student experience. Um, we've been lucky enough to be able to develop a bit of, and uh, set aside maintenance reserve funds since our merger. And this can handle um, projects upwards of three or $400,000 a year, but we have nothing on hand that can handle the needs at our high school. Um, so the work of bringing the Harvard to bond, um, or bond for the Harvard facilities is still ongoing <coughs> after this time. In five years, much of the work that was priority two has shifted into priority one, and now we're looking at $28 million for a bond and an additional $1 million for every year that it's deferred. Um, as the last speaker said, ideally we'd be doing more than deferred maintenance and upgrading um, the facilities and the complete student experience. Um, public debate around our bond is contentious because we are looking at long-term planning for our district. So if the hope is to let um, Act 46 play out and realize its efficiencies, at some point, I, I agree with the speaker who said before that maybe our, our regular spending towards um, maintenance and upgrades should not be subject to the threshold, but I think there needs to be some consideration given to do we need to refer, uh, return to some sort of carrot and stick approach to get our schools and districts to start looking at consolidation as a way to find savings and start reinvesting in our buildings. Because if we as a state are gonna show the people that come to our state how much we value education, that needs to show in the facilities that we have for our kids. Thank you. We have, um, Claire Woe from Burlington.
Thank you. I'm Claire Wool, Chair of the Burlington School Board. I'm very grateful, Jeff Francis, uh, I was able to speak today. We are very fortunate um, in Burlington uh, with the pass of 70% of our taxpayers recognizing that there was a bond needed and a capital improvement bond prior to um, three years ago. The infrastructure of our nine schools and our 11 programs serving over 4,000 students and increasing our, our population each year were in great demand. Our schools range from being built, like others have spoken today, since 1904, with infrastructure that has not improved or have had band-aids. When I think about this building and UVM being founded in 1791, when we were the 14th state, and this building built in 1833. What makes me proud of Burlington and being a host city to the University of Vermont is in January of 2019, UVM, under the Moving Mountains campaign, raised $581 million. We witness on the daily Champlain, UVM, increase their infrastructure, provide for their students. Fortunately, 30% of them being Burlington, or not Burlington, Vermonters. But we accommodate for our out-of-state students who are, come to this state for their education. And I'm very, feel very fortunate that UVM and the UVM Medical Center has been able to grow at the length and the beauty that it has, the Burner Center, in fact, I joined some of your legislators when they were invited to the Learner Center to see how they were delivering education and the facilities at the Medical Center. And I kept thinking, this is incredibly powerful and how great that they included you to see what they have done there and the money that has been spent at, on that campus. But we, as public school volunteers and educators and leaders, we don't have that ability. We have to look to our taxpayers. We have to go out and support our budget this month uh, on March 3rd, and we have to ask for bond votes. And it is very challenging to show um, what we do with our budgets that we cannot invest in our infrastructure. And like so many people spoke so eloquently um, about how, how they're making do uh, with what little they have. So I'm here to say Burlington struggles right now with the accepted bond and good fortune because of the 29 acre rule, our stormwater PCBs that we have to mitigate from a 1963 building. And we're going to put in tremendous amount of money on, on items that you will, the citizens of Burlington won't even see in the physical uh, renovation of that property. So we need your support. And growing up in Massachusetts, I have done extensive research the last two years as being chair on how Massachusetts does it. Um, and we need leadership here in Vermont. And what does that look like um, besides funds? on how we can um, you know, propose to be able to create a, a sustainable, uh, as, the, as the treasurer spoke, a sustainable way to be able to fund these buildings. Um, but we are known for our education. And we really have neglected how to fund um, our operating costs and our, our facilities, our, our infrastructure. And I'm here for support as all in Burlington, we come here, uh, I, I believe, all together to share in solving this problem. Um, but our high school is not ADA accessible. And even reaching out to our, our, our Senator uh, Leahy and, and Sanders and their call uh, for ADA accessibility when our own home, you know, the city of Burlington's high school is not ADA accessible in 2020 is, is of concern. So I'm here to help and I appreciate all that you do to serve Vermont and I'm very, very fortunate to live here and serve the students of Burlington. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That completes um, our uh, voice from the field. Um, I'd like it to open it up to members of the our committee.
they would like to ask questions. And if you can direct, figure out who you would like, like your answer from, it would be appreciated. Representative Conlon. Well, this is really kind of a question for the superintendents, and I'm not going to pick on any one that they can, can uh, ask. You know, I think what we've heard is that the capacity of the state, of state bonding is very limited, that the bond bank ceiling we're getting up close to. So if you go under the assumption that we're going to need to sort of control at a more central level uh, how dollars are handed out for school construction, you know, I think that means that there are going to be some projects that are told, you have to wait, and it could be a decade while we take care of those needs that are our most needy. And I'm, I'm just curious to know, you know, many of you have got bonds that have either failed and are trying to, to do again or, or um, have some of the immediate horizon. And I guess what I think what we would struggle with is coming up with a system of, of fairness given the immediate need that exists out there. And I guess the only to suggestions as to how we address the issue of fairness and, and if we go with an equitable way to go about this, those who might have immediate plans are willing to wait those five, ten years it might take to sort of go down the priority list. David Young. Yeah. yeah, so David Young, Superintendent of South Burlington. Why don't you question. come over here so that you'll be on the microphone? Yeah. Good question. Um, I think the bond bank question is a big one. Uh, the bond bank can't handle the magnitude that you're hearing about um, out in the field. It's just not, not sustainable. Um, I think uh, specifically to the question, what would you do? I think it's imperative that you establish some sort of a plan that identifies um, which schools are in the most critical, like mission critical, going to potentially not be able to open. And we have probably, as you've heard from Jen, we have some schools that are very close uh, to that, that functionality. It would seem to me that there would be a three-tiered or a prioritization system that would say, these are the schools most in need, and then, then the others. Um, I think that uh, we want to be able to ensure that our children in Vermont can, can go to school. But we're very close with some of these situations. We either no heat, electrical failures, uh, and, and they're not just simple electrical failures. As I said to you before, we have systems that are so old with switch gears, oil pump gear, and you can't get them. Again, we have such different capacities, the big, big items. So I would say a three-tiered system to look at the, the, the here and now and then the, the longer range ones. The problem is, is you've got a real dilemma because to not do some of those things, like for us in South Burlington, we recognize that we're at, we've got a, a reliability and risk, and I would ask you to look at reliability and risk factors connected. We have some high um, risk factors with, with low reliability, and that's part of what we're doing that Bridget uh, emphasized. So I think you really need to look at that um, from that perspective and the plan needs to be done. Again, as I said, to my knowledge, there's no plan currently in place that has any sort of warranties, structural information about our schools that rests here, um, either with the Agency of Education or with uh, facilities within Vermont. Representative Conlon. Yeah, I'm all of you, how many of you were um, in your position or something similar where you were leading uh, your school district or a school district when we had school construction dollars available from the state? Pre-moratorium? Two. Did you receive help from the state in terms, uh, during those times in terms of help and assessing your buildings and, and what was needed and prioritizing some of those items? Uh, we did not would, receive- Would you mind just coming up to the microphone so we can hear you? Sorry. Yeah. Bruce McIntyre from yeah. Madison Central School District. Uh, yes, I've been in my position for 20 years. Uh, we did not receive help in prioritizing uh, projects, uh, the construction aid, we had to qualify for construction aid. There were criteria that we had to meet in order to receive construction aid. However, um, projects were developed with the uh, in combination with the school board and the um, you know facilities department uh, and determined need at the local level. 
uh, and then once once we had a project uh, that uh, we move forward with, we would approach the state uh, to work with them to make sure what we want to do fit within the criteria of school construction. Aid. And those criteria were put in place in 2006 and 2005. Yes. And that's the late, those are still in effect, so to speak, only uh, there's no entity to work with the school boards or your local schools. And right. once there's a preliminary application form that's been submitted to, at that point, the Department of Education, then that would trigger them working with you folks. And then there'd be a point system for prioritizing your projects. Correct. And none of that, that's still in place, but none of that has been accessed after the moratorium. Correct. There's been no check and balance. I don't believe there's been anybody at the state level to review those. And also, in terms of school construction projects, not all of the a person or not all of the school project will be eligible for state construction dollars pre moratorium. It had to be eligible costs. Correct. So even though you may have a $50 million project and we had a 30% school construction program, didn't mean the 30% of that $50 million would be paid for by the state. That is correct. It, it would be less than that. Yes. So another question, and I, I'm asking all folks now, how much when, when there's a request for state dollars to help with your construction projects, what are you looking for? Is it 10% of that project? Is it 100% of that Anything. project? Anything. Anything. Something. That's it. <laughs> Jim, what about de and what about deferred maintenance? Because deferred maintenance is not covered under school construction dollars at this point. So two thoughts. One is that manual, when we, went, when we put a bond out last spring, we used that manual and went through all the criteria to do our analyses of Burke and Concord and Moonberg. And we produced, it's an incredibly effective document because it asks you to look at everything from the actual physical plant to educational needs. So that document itself we found very helpful. The, the second piece is when we put our um, outlay of our financial liability for a bond last spring when we, we put a $24 million bond which failed for four to one. We used the, the um, actual dollar amount, but then we said if we return to school construction aid and we got 30%, this is what the cost of the bond would be. So we ran those numbers hypothetically. The eligible cost? Correct. We ran them hypothetically just to in terms of the square footage per pupil or in terms of what would be allowable costs. So the, what, what I'm saying is the tool was very effective for us to look at our systems and then predict out whether that's true across the board for the whole state and continuing. But it was the only thing we had. And, and my point is, when you have a tool like that that everyone is using to apply equally, it's a very effective measure. Whether that's the correct one, I don't know. So if we had a tool like that in doing the facilities assessment to find out what the real need is out there, would that be helpful? I think as, as my colleague from South Burlington said, the tier one, tier two, tier three, it's a way to put different systems and their needs into buckets so that you can move forward based on what the overall need is. But I would bet, when I showed you my map, I did a little bit of all my schools. I have eight schools. There's four of them that have much higher needs. And I bet if you did a map of Vermont, you would have a similar type of, these ones have huge needs, these ones have medium needs, these ones have smaller needs. But everyone, I mean, when you have a, a state where your buildings, a lot of them were built in the 60s, you know, we're, we're hitting that point. And we, we were built in the 50s and 60s, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Somewhere in the 40s. <laughs> the baby boom. The, the, the baby yeah. boom. Yeah. 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 So for anybody that wants to take it, maybe with Dr. Patrick, because you haven't been up, uh, this is not a new conversation for us. This is a conversation that's been going on for several years here. Should, should the need arise, obviously we have walked into a perfect storm now where a lot of uh, need is now arising. But one of the questions we've had, and it's an ongoing question, is many of our school districts statewide have spent 
millions of dollars to keep their, to expand their facilities, uh, maybe do some maintenance, uh, do some water quality issues, and they have spent that money without state aid since the moratorium has been effected in 2008, Eight, 2008. Seven Seven what do we say to those communities? I mean, I mean, you guys, you folks are sitting here looking at us. You're moving forward. You want to move forward from today, or if, if something can be worked out from that day. But what do we say to the school districts that are spending money today? My school district, the high, one of the high schools in my school district, is spending a half a million dollars this year to put a new entrance into the school because the old entrance is falling off the school. They're not waiting. They're doing it. So what do we say to those folks? How do we handle that? And that's been an ongoing question for me uh, as, as, uh, as we think about maybe moving forward again on, on school construction and state aid school construction. So Patrick Green, superintendent for Mount Abraham Unified School District. I guess what I would say is that we, we fit that description, I think, in Mount Abraham Unified. Um, I would say, folks, we recognize you've been putting this money in. We recognize this is a big issue, and we're going to take some time to figure out the right way to address this long term. And in the immediate, we want to provide you some relief and not have those costs that you're building into your budgets count against your spending for equalized pupil, because probably many of those districts, true for us, are also facing declining enrollment. They're seeing escalating costs, decreasing pupil, um, equalized pupil counts, and are at the spending threshold. I see our costs as being relatively fixed. We're at the spending threshold now. Our community, I think, has no appetite for paying a, a penalty for exceeding the spending threshold. And so we're going to have to cut one to $2 million annually to stay at the spending threshold. Right now, for us, one million of that is in construction services. That would buy us some time to figure out what's the long-term plan. It would acknowledge um, the efforts we put in to make sure that we're taking care of those facilities needs. Um, and to know that help is on the way, whatever that may be, would be, I think, some, some welcomed information. So I think I hear, maybe I didn't, but I think I hear that uh, taking the uh, uh, executive construction services from the uh, excess spending threshold would be a big help. Absolutely, Number yes. One, that would be a, a big help cur currently. So, and something that could happen more immediately, recognizing but I, I didn't hear was, well, what do I say to my school district that four years ago, put a million dollars in. What do I say to them today when I'm sitting here asked to, asking to, be, uh, to vote on an issue where we're going to uh, start school construction funding again and only go forward? What do I say to the folks in my district that, sorry, we missed you? You know, what's the answer? That's, that, that's a problem that I, I, I'm, I'm grappling with, and I, I think many others are grappling with that problem also. You don't have to answer sure. today, but you may want to think about that a little bit. It's a pretty complicated question. Absolutely. And, and I guess my only thought on that is there were some thoughts, I think, raised by the treasurer early on about what that, that same question, what do we do about that? And that may be part of something that's worth investigating. And, and maybe the answer is, sorry, we can't do anything for you, but maybe the answer is we can, and I think that's part of the investigation. Thank you. To, to um, Butch's question. Yeah, please. And just Very quickly. For the record, your name. Yeah. <laughs> Mary Beth Banios, Windsor Central. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. For me, the perspective is that at some points, buildings outlive their useful life. And it's not a question of deferred maintenance, but in fact, the building has outlived its useful life. I'll give you two examples in our particular situation. Um, one is that we have septic pipes that run um, underneath all the floors of all of our schools. Um, in order to get those cleans up, cleaned out, at this point, they're about 70% blocked. We would, if, if once they get further blocked, we would actually have to jackhammer up all the floors and pull them out to clean them because of the way the building is built. Um, similarly, we have steam um, tunnels that, live, um, that lie across the floor. When the building was being built, it was fine to put them in. The clearance is about three feet, right? And they, the, the floor above them is, is collapsing in. You can't get somebody to go in there and actually go there to repair them. They're not accessible. Um, so the reality is that it is not, um, I can speak for our district, I think that, that our district 
takes a lot of pride in the care that it's, it's taken for the building. Um, it hasn't been a question of deferred maintenance, but it is simply not possible at this point to do the level of repair or financially wise to do that, that it gets to a point where it needs to be in the build. Um, so that's, that's one perspective that may help address the concern you raise. But it still doesn't answer my, our question. What do we tell the folks, if anything, perhaps, that have put uh, millions of dollars into their buildings without school construction aid? Mm -hmm. Another answer, another potential answer. Jen Bozzo Jarns at Kingdom East. I think what you would tell them is when you pass Act 166 Universal Pre-K, the schools that were already doing Universal Pre-K, you didn't say to them, oh, yeah. when you passed Act 46 and there were incentives for some districts and not, with Act 173, the schools right now that are doing special ed block grant type programs, we don't, we don't move backwards. The second thing you would say to them is, we just had a waiting study which talks about 20 years worth of inequity in our rural, sparsely populated, high poverty areas. Some of these schools I talked to you about, we have 80, 90% of children from poverty. That's very different than a community that has 13 to 15% children from poverty. And I don't know if you all know who Ellie Purrier is. She's the runner from Vermont who just broke the national record in the mile. Our rural kids could be NASA scientists, Olympic runners, just as our kids from high, more, more wealthy areas. So that's the question that you have, is what does the Vermont Constitution obligate you to do for all of our children? So that's what I would say to folks. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. David, did you want to add to Yeah, just one additional thing for Jen. I think uh, currently Act 68, as you know, the funding formula, all, all of our, our, uh, our needs are baked into the, to the total expenditure line. So when you divide that, you know, that divisor, it's a, it's a state draw system. So unfortunately or fortunately, the yield had to be adjusted to accommodate for that particular situation. And that's not... Uh, any different than what we have amongst my colleagues that have talked earlier about these high expenses. There, for us, as, as we're looking at pushing a bond out that's 209, it's going to be within the expenditure line, and it's going to factor into the draw from the Ed Fund. So to, to your, to your uh, situation, it would be, although it's not sustainable on, on a wide-scale basis in the state, but it, it is currently going to be baked into the decision that it that decides the yield uh, and as you heard from Patrick, we have a lot of things in play around equalized pupil, our common level of appraisal, and that yield determination that is part of our state system. Thank you, Sam. We have a bill. I don't know if you've, who's taken a look at this, but we are interested in your feedback. Um, this is a bill that looks at getting that inventory and looking at possible funding. It does not, at this point, talk about prioritizing that list. It's very clear that we probably need some help in uh, identifying those things that we need to be looking at in this inventory. And just wondering if, if anybody has any specific feedback or would like to send in specific feedback to our, our committees on things that, your feedback on this bill, because we will be moving forward with something. Please. Christine Sullivan from Harvard again. I guess I would just uh, like to respectfully request that in looking at any bill and these um, requirements and, and inventory going forward that we're not delaying these projects that need to happen another five or 10 years down the road. I think that would be a real disservice to the students that are currently in our schools and to the work that these boards and districts have done. Um, it, it's not, you know, Kids go to school, and my, my children go to school in um, classrooms that have leaking roofs during rainstorms. And that's just, to, to defer that further out would be a, an injustice to our students. I have heard swirling some interest from some uh, members of our, our body to uh, put a moratorium on any bonding until this is completed. So I'm guessing that you would say that's not a good idea. I think that would be a travesty. Look for the more tar, gotcha. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I mean, honestly, I, I don't want to um, take down other people's bond projects, but 
I think uh, Burlington was at 91 million, and South Burlington's at 209 million, and everybody else in this room is talking about less than 50 million dollars. And and it, if if something, talk about inequity. If something like 200 million dollars gets to go through, and this has to wait, that that's not right. Thank you. Other questions? <coughs> Felicia? Yeah. Um, I guess this is just a question coming to everybody who testified about their school commission, uh, specifically those that have failed bond votes. Um, do you think if there was a school construction in program to cover 30% of eligible costs, that your 0 for 3 bond passage Rate would switch. Do you think you could get a bond through if there was that very simple cost? So, Patrick Green, Mount Abraham, um, I would say instead of being over three, we'd be one for two. Um, I think we would not have passed our first, just given the margin being what it was. Our second, our second attempt to pass a bond failed 48%, uh, 52%. A 30% uh, construction aid that would have alleviated a lot of the cost, I suspect would have been, the cost was the number one driving factor, I think, in, in talking to a lot of folks. Uh, the 30% um, support on the eligible cost, I think, would have made the difference in that vote. And then, to kind of more of the Northeast Kingdom, for school construction aid historically in the state of Montana, only covered 30% of eligible. Are you guys able to pick up 70% of a multi-million dollar bond? Is that something that realistically you can make to the population? I think that's a, a great question. Um, a lot of community members have asked me, knowing I'm just asking for a million dollars, have come to me and said, is there any hope that the state will help us, even at 30%, and how is that going to impa impact our tax base? Um, I think they would they would definitely jump on it um, because they care so much about their students. These are small little communities that want their kids to succeed. And so they want to be able to put into the building and provide the same opportunities as they do in other areas of the state. So I think that just this discussion today has given my community some hope that there may be, at least we're talking about it, that there may be help coming. Well, I, I just want to clarify this 30%. And I just want to make sure, I don't know if, if you're really clear. If you've got a $100 million school construction project, and we say, well, there's 30% state aid to that, it doesn't mean we're picking up 30% of that $100 million. I think that needs to be made very, very clear. It's what is eligible for the 30%. So I'm not going to do math in public. Whatever 30% is of 100 million. <laughs> 30 million? million? <laughs> 300, 300, no. 300, about 300. 300 million. Wait, I'm trying. <laughs> Million is about the state share, but it won't end up being 30 million. It might end up being 20 million or 10 million based on what is eligible. Also, on the ballot, the way the wording has to be on the ballot is the full cost of that construction project not the amount minus the state aid. It is the full cost because the district municipality is responsible for the full cost because the state aid may not come through in a timely manner. So you still have to bond for that full amount. So those are the nuances to school construction. So when folks say, oh, there's state aid, it's not apples to apples. And we're not sure going forward where what that's going to be. Well, how that will relate to the new one. I know a Representative Matos had a question. Um, uh, Patrick Green. So, 
you said if you had the 30% of the virtual cost, you would have won. One for two. One for two. <laughs> and I noticed you said you had a study done that said you needed $17 million. And you put a bond out for 32. Why double? Uh, that, so that took place prior to my arrival as superintendent, but from what I understood, that was that addressed the lack of natural light, that addressed the tandem classrooms where people had to pass through, uh, it addressed a lot of other sort of um, flow and function needs that weren't necessarily infrastructure needs. So I just curious about why sure. double from what the study yeah. said. So I also just had a question. Some of the problems, not, not necessarily from you, but thank you. Um, some of the, the concerns that I heard raised sounded like health violations. And I'm wondering if you've had any, any problems with health violations. That's probably to you. <laughs> yeah. So about a month ago, we had to close one of our schools for a day because one of our air handling systems in one of the mobile units, uh, the fan belt broke and there was smoke and it burned out. We closed the school, we got in, we realized there's no ventilation in this part of the building. So have we, we do air quality tests. However, the lack of ventilation, I, I consider it a health concern. We have four buildings where that's an issue. We've got five buildings where the insulation is little to none and there's energy costs. We have two buildings where the entrance ways in terms of safety at the Lunenburg School, you, um, the teachers buzz it, you know, it, it's, it's just not, not safe. Um, to, I just want to get back to the question of in the Northeast Kingdom, do you think you can pass a bond? St. Johnsbury just passed a bond for safety infrastructure changes. It was a small bond, a little over a million. Um, I can't remember the exact amount. And I know in past, uh, Burke has passed a smaller bond. We just merged seven district, in, in, seven individual school districts have become one. So what this word on the street is, why should I who live in town X pay for something in town Y? And so we need time to do that work around there, all of our children, and they're all important to us. And we're taking this year to do that work. And then we're looking at ways also to maybe merge our middle schools versus our, our high schools. We just did a, a public information session where we had 10 options. We've narrowed it down to four. We're going to research and then go forward with that. So I, I'm confident and optimistic all the time, but I can't answer that question because I just don't know. Yeah. I have one question. I have a question of you. <laughs> I just want to follow up on that um, comment as well. Um, I'm, I'm dealing with the same issue with our interstate discussions. Um, New Hampshire doesn't want to pay for my building needs. Um, and through this study, um, thankfully that was funded, I'm finding out all kinds of things. And this is my third year um, in the school district um, dealing with, I have no ventilation. There's ductwork, it's been blocked off. I have, I have no heat controls. Um, we open windows um, <coughs> because there's no controls in, in the, um, with the heating systems. The boilers are outdated. There's so many different concerns that I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed, but I don't want to see our interstate activities fail because I think it's just an opportunity that we can do more for our students for a less cost for our taxpayers. So I have a question of you. And when you testified, you mentioned how the New Hampshire schools were in much better shape. Is there a funding mechanism over there? How have they dealt with, do you know? We're going to have that. For New Hampshire? We have that information. For New Hampshire? Yes. We can show, we can show the, how many other states? Five other states? We should, we've done some research on four other states. So we can show in the last 10 minutes if you want. Okay. Are we ready to move on to the presentation? Are there other questions? Felicia, did you have a question? One last question, and it's a general question about capacity. Uh, coming from representing a small town that Ellie Perrier has made very, very proud. Uh, it's abundantly clear to me that even the small bonds are contentious. And school construction clearly is going to be a quick or easy fix. It's not going to get to you in this budget cycle or the next one, or maybe even the next one. So there's a lot of groundwork that has to be done here before we can 
getting some going. But with one out of every $3 the state bond already spent on education, how do you expect us to immediately help your situation? Look for answers. I, I know we all have problems that I'm not sympathetic. I hear them and I hear them back home as well. But realistically, if we're looking for solutions going look forward together, this is quick. So we already are on the ropes for education. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah. So Patrick Green, Madrid Unified. So I used to think school um, school bond projects were contentious, so we started talking about closing schools. <laughs> and that has shifted my perspective on what is contentious and what is not. Um, I would offer um, the, the immediate um, relief comes in not counting dollars built into budgets for those districts that have figured out how to build that in against the spending threshold. It's at least one less thing we have that's working against us trying to do what we need to do to take care of the schools and take care of the kids. Okay. Okay. Were there any more questions for the superintendents for the school districts or should we be ready to move on? At least there may be some hope coming. At least I'm standing here. Oh, okay, excuse me, there was one more. I should have one question for Jennifer. Yeah. Do you know why the vote was voted down four times for the bond? So it, it was a four to one ratio. Oh. Four times as many people voted no than yes. Do you know, do you know why such money? a large? Uh, money and also the notion of uh, my town. People really aren't yet comfortable or aware of the one district. And so, also the cost. So the cost. And you're in a high poverty area. So it's funded through the Ed Fund. Do they get higher property tax prebates and not feel because the full impact of, of the increase in property tax, so to speak? So I believe, uh, looking at last year's, Marty Feld has helped me with this. I believe um, we spent $32 million. We put in $21 million, Kingdom East, in terms of the Ed Fund. So we do, and also we have um, income sensitivity in all yep. of our towns. Yep. Okay. Just, yeah. just did, did the um, towns that were going to receive the construction um, <coughs> aid, did they support? So the did it get broken down in that way? Our, our votes are coming. They're coming. I should know that. <laughs> OK. We are ready to move on. We're Hi. welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Epstein. I'm an architect and managing principal of Truex Collins. We're an architecture and interior design firm in Burlington, Vermont. And with me is Jeff Francis. I'm the executive director of the Superintendents Association. I want to just pause and thank all of you for um, listening to this testimony. And I want to thank the folks who came out to provide it. It's part of the story that we're all trying to work together on. and we're all trying to figure this out, and I appreciate the fact that you are trying to figure it out, so thank you. As, as many of you may know, uh, Jeff and I, um, after the last legislative session, um, put together an ad hoc group of superintendents <coughs> and facilities managers. Um, we had conversations with uh, an architects, and also we had conversations with the bond bank, with the treasurer, with Massachusetts School Board of Authority, with uh, an architecture firm that does the statewide assessments for them. So we've, we've tried to do a lot of research, and we're here to help present some of that to you um, in an effort to inform the process. Um, so this is uh, a chart that um, talks about, so, well, let me go back. On the PowerPoint, you'll see the map um, shows, um, just points out, makes a graphic, uh, Vermont's the only state in the Northeast without a school construction program. There's only 11 states in the whole country that don't have construction programs. Um, Vermont is one of those. Um, we did a brief survey of some surrounding states, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine, and we've had more ongoing conversations with Massachusetts. Um, we've got some slides that the MSBA has provided us that we can share if you want to go a little deeper dive. But, um, at the top is just the state information. You can see the um, you can see that uh, Rhode Island has a similar number of um, schools 
they have a, a greater enrollment. Um, so they have, um, and they, so they have about 300 schools. Interestingly enough, um, when the legislature was um, grappling with the very same problem, um, they were guessing 1.5 billion. When they did their statewide assessment, it was three billion dollars for their 304 schools. And that was a boots on the ground statewide assessment. Um, interestingly enough, all of the uh, states except for Maine had a moratorium. Um, Rhode Island's was from 2011 to 2015, New Hampshire um, from 2011 to 2020, and Massachusetts um, between 04 and 07. Um, and they all came out of that uh, process with a, with a new revamped system. Uh, the funding source, Rhode Island funded it with a $250 million bond. And um, New Hampshire and Maine used an appropriation. Massachusetts has a penny on the sales tax. Uh, the, uh, the only one that has a maximum reimbursement is New Hampshire at, at $50 million per project. <laughs> Um, one of the things I wanted to address, and Alice, you were talking about the 30% um, um, rule, is that uh, for all of these states, 30% is the starting point, and then they have incentive bonuses to get you between 30, and you can see 30 to 60, 30 to 90, 30 to 80. Um, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, I'm just saying that's what the other states in our, 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 our sort of comparable states to our doing. And, those criteria and bonus incentives include um, the health, safety, and welfare, um, whether you're replacing school or, or repairing school. Consolidation, you can see in Rhode Island and New Hampshire is a factor. So what happens is that you start with 30% of eligible costs, and then there's, you add 2%, you know, a certain percentages for each one of those categories. Um, educational enhancements, decreasing overcrowding, increasing utilization, energy efficiency. So almost, well, I would say all of these have a base amount and then they have incentives. Now they do also have, um, they all have criteria. Not everybody gets the money. Um, it's not necessarily, an, uh, except for Rhode Island, and, and I, we need to drill down a little bit further, because they refer to their program as an entitlement program, but they're all, uh, you have a step one and a step two. First, you define the need, and that goes through a ranking system, and then you develop the solution. And that's pretty consistent with all of these programs. Um, the, some of the things that, uh, it was interesting with Rhode Island was, um, in some of these cases, actually in New Hampshire, there were some, uh, so maintenance, uh, Massachusetts, a couple of these states have requirements that you spend a certain amount on maintenance per year. Like if you have a building of a certain age, so they want to know that you're doing your part. Um, and you think that's, a, you know, uh, a great thing. In Massachusetts, it seems to be a, a system that has been in place for a long time. But with the other state, I think it was New Hampshire, uh, Rhode Island, um, it's turned out to be a deterrent because, because towns don't want to spend the money to spend to that maintenance threshold, then um, they're not eligible for state aid. And uh, so it's actually penalizing poor towns that can't spend the maintenance requirement on their buildings. Um, another thing is that the cost of the planning up front, uh, many of these, um, Many of these, uh, Maine, for example, in Rhode Island, require up to a level called schematic design, mm -hmm. uh, which, is a, which is far more than we do in Vermont. And it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars you have to spend to develop your project um, so that the state can say whether, um, you know, what they're gonna contribute as part of, of that cost. And that, in some cases, some of the states have, have acknowledged that that is a, a barrier too because Towns don't want to spend money up front without knowing whether they're getting money from the state. Um, I do have, if people would like to hear more about Massachusetts, I could go a little bit more in depth about Massachusetts. Are there any questions so far? 
I kind of riffed through that pretty quickly. Hear about Massachusetts. Okay. One penny on the sales tax, huh? Yeah. Sounds like an easy lift for Vermont, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, excuse me, Representative Two. Thank you. Um, you said Vermont is the only state without a construction program. Um, we currently spend a third of our budget, our entire state budget, on education. Do we know what the other states are spending <coughs> comparative to the their like ed spending compared to their state budget? No, no, no. I mean that's a that's a number that's e easily. Yeah, obtainable, but yeah. we don't have it. Okay, thank you. Yep. The other thing that I just know, so in Massachusetts, for example, we also have different funding formula, right? Yeah. So I think Massachusetts is on something similar to the foundation formula, so that the sliding scale in Massachusetts awards school construction aid dollars based on the need, which is the community <laughs> income reference. So it's not all um, incentives. Right. I, I don't know what the relative but yeah, we can we'll, we can go into that if so, people want. But but one of the things that I just point out is that well, it doesn't, it doesn't just keep going. Well, I think the so so just relative to the funding, some of them are similar to the Vermont system, where you get your you know, the state's going to pay X, but you don't know when you're going to get it. Massachusetts is a pay-as-you-go system. That was very important to them. So. Um, they, you, you provide them with actual, your invoices, and they pay their share of it on the spot to reduce, so that you can reduce the, uh, I'm not sure if they have to bond for the full amount. And there's other states that pay, um, I think it might be Rhode Island where they pay a, um, over the length of the bond, they're paying their share in terms of the debt service each year. So they're not giving you cash they're paying a portion of your debt service each year. And that leverages, I think, more projects with the $250 million bond that we have. So can I just ask a question on that? Sure. So paying that must come out of their general fund then, paying the bond costs for those schools. Right, the bond costs have to come from some. It comes, comes out of the general fund. Right, right, much, yeah, I, I assume so. Uh, any other questions? I, I can. Uh, some of this is, is a repeat. This is the map. These are slides that Massachusetts has provided us. Um, the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Board Authority, is an independent public authority with a separate dedicated revenue stream. It's not part of the Commonwealth's annual budget. They are solely responsible for its debt, um, and it's not a general obligation of the Commonwealth. So it's a completely separate uh, authority. So that's a different model than um, what we had before. Um, they basically got into the same the situation that Vermont did. They got very far behind on their payments. Um, they were not able to uh, promise, even say when they could pay. Um, it was one of the things they talk about is that their program was perceived as an entitlement that every district received funding. It was generally like if you applied, you got it. And so, um, and there was no dedicated source of revenue. And there was no cap on the number of projects that could be funded. And all of these things they corrected in their minds with the new system.